I came into industrial design um, kind of with two things um, or the inspiration for it. First of all, my, my father was an environmental designer, so I was very aware of the design processes and the design firm type of lifestyle and career. And then I also had an interest in product development from a sports background and testing new consumer products for one of my sponsors. So I knew I could kind of combine both my artistic talent and just the knowledge and interest I had in consumer products into one career. Uh, to formally become an industrial designer, you actually are part of a building arts program similar to architecture, but um, in the case of architecture where you're studying and looking at the tolerances for building construction, you're working on consumer and mass-produced goods. Um, there are quite a few really good programs in the United States. Um, it traditionally is a four-year to six-year degree depending on how long you go and your specialties. There's not a party where I introduce myself and tell what I do that people don't think I design the floors of factory space and how things function and move. The actual title industrial designer came from the industrial revolution. When we converted from being artisan and the people actually create the products we sell into um, having careers that related to mass produced goods. An industrial designer is the guy who conceptualizes and stylizes a lot of the products for the consumer market. Um, so it was that transition during the industrial revolution where again the artisan to blow, actually blew the glass of the vase that you purchased to having someone sketch and design a product that would be created time and time again for years to come. For everyday essence there are some challenges. We get products at very different states. Um, to compare to the traditional client where you get RFPs and, and you're at a, a true defined starting point and there's objectives, uh, we kind of set those objectives ourselves. And then another fact is that we have to kind of extrapolate the real technology, the raw idea that, that makes this a new innovation. Um, inventors do a really good job of actually disguising their concept with bells and whistles that don't really apply to the consumer that's going to be sold for or just to the function of the product. So kind of stripping it down and getting to the raw ingredients of what makes this unique and innovative is one of the real important parts of a job. Um, of course the first thing we do is a lot of research. Um, the, the first step of, is, also, is always an intellectual property search. Um, then we get into design criteria and that's the process where we really start stripping down the product to the bare essentials of what the intellectual property is, who the customer will be. Um, after the initial theorized design criteria, we go into a round of consumer benchmarking and research to see what's going on in the marketplace. If we're targeting um, tween girls, we start researching and seeing what their interests are, what colors they like, what textures they like, and then what are the competitive products in the marketplace. Sometimes those competitive products are very direct, sometimes they're just products that we can look at their success and failure and kind of gauge and, where, and decide how we would create a successful product. The brainstorming process for industrial design and, and product development changes by the product. To tell you that there's one methodology that works for every product would just be a false statement. I mean, it would be nice and professional for me to say this eight-step process delivers a successful product, but the truth is with the variety that we work on here, things are very different. And we brainstorm in many ways. Traditional drawing board, you know, just sketching out 100 concepts. Team meetings, we're collaborating and throwing out verbiage to describe this product and where it needs to go. To even activities like actually going out into the consumer marketplace and validating sketches or testing prototypes. Um, brainstorming just happens in so many different ways. And it doesn't actually happen nine to five either. It can happen over the weekend, a trip to a potential retailer or just something to inspire someone to, to move the concept forward. The reason that hand sketching is still valuable and something that I even teach my interns is that like with brainstorming, you never know when and ha where you're going to have to communicate a concept. And whether it's a meeting, a professional presentation that's been planned for two weeks, sketching is that basic level of communication besides verbal that communicates an idea. You can do it on an airplane, a tour bus, um, in your garage, in front of a client, two weeks before and you know, make it presentable and more, and more of a presentation piece. But it's just that, that core um, activity to conceptualization and design that you just can't lose. Um, the truth is you have to start somewhere and there's nothing faster than a piece of pencil and paper. Um, obviously there are ways other people conceptualize. You know, they may do it verbally with descriptions and I've had actually inventors deliver tape of, of what they're thinking of the concept you can't sketch, but we can sketch something out in 30 seconds. Um, to go straight to a 3D model where you're spending a day is a waste of time when you can really evaluate something quicker than that. We actually have a, a, a professional wrestling ring in the studio that we use for handoffs. 
um, which makes it really interesting. And you know, we challenge each other. Yes, I want this color, and that's normally an arm wrestle match. When it comes to real form and aesthetics, um, that's when we get more into full contact. But to tell you, to, the interesting thing about handoffs, it does depend on the product. I mean, when it comes to textiles and fashion and luggage, it pretty much stays in, in industrial design. When it comes to things that involve innovations in manufacturing technologies, that's when we really start collaborating with engineering because what we're doing is we're creating the, the conceptual art in the surfaces. Engineering has to create the, the tangible product in the end that has wall thickness, structure, and tolerance. So depending on the product, they can get involved quite early. Um, formally, we do a handoff phase where we actually share our archive of research and ideation because what I've learned is as part of the process, you're constantly selling. You have to convince engineering that the reason that they're going to spend more hours on a product compared to just ordering out of a catalog. And you have to actually sell to them the fact that this is what's going to make it more innovative, better for the consumer, and more successful. So handoffs do become kind of a sales pitch in a way, um, and they just happen at different points. For some products that involve testing, a handoff will happen um, post ideation and pre-form model, and then we'll collaborate through the rest of the process. And then like we said earlier with some of the fashion concepts, we'll just go all the way through the end and, and the engineering handoff may be one element of the product. It may just be a buckle or an injection molded part. So from the last two seasons, We've had very interesting products. They're all over the board. Um, I would say the kind of the one that developed and was smooth, which would surprise most, was actually a product that we designed for an industrial designer himself. Um, that was the Koku cutting board. That project went through professional methodology and just seemed to be a very smooth, no kind of hitch in the road um, that really set us back on a timeline or anything. It just progressed nicely. Um, the final product was a better performing and aesthetic product. The client, of course, loved the concept and being an industrial designer, he had appreciation for it. So that was one that just went pretty smooth. Um, the challenging ones, uh, let's see. I think Workout 180 was, was a challenge just because of the intellectual landscape that we had to deal with. I mean, imagine doing your job and finding out there's 2,000 ways you can't do it. Um, that makes it very difficult to create something for a crowded market. The interesting thing about the challenging products, though, is that they are, those are the products that keep you on your A-game. That's what makes the other ones easier because you're having to you know, kind of bend and flex to what's, what your process is. And you learn and you sometimes adapt new processes. A good example with that challenge on Workout 180 is we started getting the branding team involved earlier on. And in that case, it was just to facilitate testing. But I think that's what actually allowed them to have an kind of their process of developing the brand of Workout 180 was easier because they were involved earlier on. So you learn stuff with the difficult products. The advice I give to inventors is don't be restricted by your talents and your abilities. Um, good inventors realize that they have to bring someone in if it comes time to um, and maybe share part of the intellectual property or explore the idea or they learn to adapt to what their skill set is. If, they're, if they come from background in furniture and they, they have that as a hobby, we see inventors who can create incredible prototypes. Um, if they come from an artistic background, we see inventors who can actually sketch very well. Um, so being able to collaborate with your peers and then using your talents to create the deliverables that, that are presentable. Um, I think that the challenge is you get some inventors who, who may not have prototyping skills and may not have drawing skills. And for them, it's how do you create a tangible way of, of communicating your concept. And for those, it may be initial research. It may be doing more benchmarking and showing and proving that there is a marketplace for this product or creating a very good concept brief that allows an industrial designer or engineer to further the concept even more. So you just, as an inventor, you've got to sit there and you've got to realize, okay, this is what I'm good at. I know the marketplace and I can, I'm an incredible writer. So if you write up a good concept brief, you're moving the product forward. And that's what's most important is just that forward progress in the process.